Welcome to this session that talks about what do you need to know about raising money from a venture capital. The goal of this session really is to help to peel back the curtain to really understand this mysterious process of raising money from how do you identify a VC, uh, how do you talk to them, how do you pitch to them, how do you conduct diligence, what happens post-investment. So we brought up three of the top VCs in the world to talk exactly about what do you need about raising venture capital. So I'll first start with, my name is Arthur Johnson. I'm the Vice President of Partnerships, Corporate Development, and also run the Tulio Fund. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And so what we're going to do first, gentlemen, we're going to go through a quick round, introduce yourself, the firm you're with, and when you invested in Twilio, and what round, and how did you first discover Twilio? Uh, my name is Scott Rainey. I'm a partner with Redpoint Ventures. Uh, we, I think, invested in the Series C. Is that right? I'm trying to remember. It. Yeah, C or C is. We, uh, we made the, uh, the, the, the awesome decision not to invest in the Series A when we saw Jeff, who came in and uh, corrected our mistake later. So. I'm Matt Garrett. I'm at, uh, I run Salesforce Ventures. It's the uh, strategic investment arm for Salesforce. And we actually invested in the last round, um, which was much later stage than we typically invest in. But we'd had a, uh, started to develop a nice relationship through our Heroku platform and other applications where we're seeing more telephony wanting to be integrated into our products. So from a strategic standpoint, it made a lot of sense to, to invest at that time. Great, and I'm Byron Dieter with Bessemer Venture Partners. Uh, we invested first at the seed stage uh, with Twilio with a $125,000 check, and I uh, was reading through our investment memo the other day, and the, the uh, sense that I loved was something along the lines of, Twilio's growth has been uninspiring, but the pace of product innovation is awesome. And I looked through it, and literally they had two down months in revenue. The numbers were tiny, 20K MRR at the time. But they were trending down at the point when we invested. And so um, it was all about the product innovation, and that continues today. Thanks, gentlemen. So we're going to try and take this discussion through the arc of a VC investment. So the first set of questions will be around how do you approach a VC. Then we'll talk about uh, pitching and diligence. Then we'll get into negotiating the term sheet. And then we'll wrap up with a, a fun question for the VCs. So the first question I have is for Scott. So when you talk about, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to try and identify a venture capital firm to, to talk to, uh, should you try to, to, to a broad focus or a very narrow focus? So should you call everybody you know? Should you just call a, a handful of investors? What's the right criteria you should use to select and start talking to uh, a venture capital firm? Uh, you should call Redpoint. <laughs> That's it. Um, you know, I think the, uh, the, the first thing I would say is the most important thing is that uh, Whatever venture firm you, you, you end up meeting with, you're getting connected through some kind of common connection. I think it's really difficult to, we say, go over the transom and, and come in uh, cold without any contacts or any set of relationships that, can be, uh, that, can, that both sides can use to calibrate one another. And so I think what you want to do is, is find those places where you feel like you have the best, uh, the best relationships. The second thing is, I think what you want to do is to, is to probably be more focused than, than not um, and find those groups that you think ultimately have a chance to add the most value. Um, I think that's you know, not surprising. But um, that can either come through individuals at those venture firms or it can come from a firm, you know, kind of a firm-wide uh, impression that you might have based on their portfolio. So, Thanks. So, Matt, question for you. When it comes to targeting a VC, should you th how do you think about targeting the traditional VC firm versus firms that are part of corporate, uh, a corporate VC? How yeah, should uh, entrepreneurs I, think about that? Yeah, I think building on Scott's point, I mean, when you're out raising money, you should just have in your mind at each stage of the company, who are the right investors, which are the right firms, which are the right partners. And I think people that are very targeted and treat it like a sales process are typically the most effective. I think a corporate venture, there's often this view, I think, that it's like this completely different animal. And I think it's really thinking about at each of those stages in which investors you're going to bring on, what are you getting for that? There's some VCs that are better for early stage, some that are better for later, some that have other specialties. And I think, um, I think it's, it's when is it the best fit? And so for us, we're typically a Series A, Series B, and Series C investor. That's where we think we provide the most value. Um, that's when we're able to engage with companies the best and, 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 and work with them. But it's going to be different for, other, for every corporate um, firm. Sometimes we will do a seed investment if it's really strategic and we can see clear alignment early on. So I think it's understanding what space you're, gonna, you're, you're working in, who are the corporates that are going to be most strategic to you, understanding wh you know, what, what, do they, what do they ask in return, um, how easy are they to work with. And so I think it's just you have to treat everybody somewhat individually, I think. 
Thanks, Matt. So, Brian, let's say, so Scott said basically he likes to get introductions from people he knows. What if you don't know anybody? You don't know any VCs, it's not in your network. What's the right or the best kind of cold calling approach you've seen that works with you? Because you have a dozen emails going through your, uh, your computer all the time. So, what works from a cold calling perspective to get your attention? Sure. Um, and I'd say, by the way, uh, I see a lot of people standing in the back. There are some seats up here if you want to work your way in, make yourself comfortable. We won't be offended if you walk through. Uh, uh, grab a seat, please. Um, but uh, in terms of this notion of friendly referrals for venture folks and, uh, and why does it make sense for both sides, um, from our side, uh, the reality is we get hammered by a lot of cold inbounds. It's a nature of the job and it's not, uh, we don't have capacity. Time is our scarce resource. We don't have the capacity to review them all. And so usually there's two ways of filtering things rationally. One is sectors you know or themes that you're particularly excited about. And then the other is some trusted referral point, uh, someone pounding on your door saying, you've got to meet with this entrepreneur. He or she is awesome. And with the exception of one of those two things, it typically just doesn't uh, get over the hurdle because we're in uh, you know, a limited time environment. And so if you're in a situation where you don't have that trusted referral, uh, the first thing I'd say is try to find it, um, and your entire you know, uh, entrepreneurial life is going to be convincing people uh, that you're worth spending time with, customers, partners, employees, investors, etc. So get good at it and find people that can get you into venture firms because that's part of the process, and it's, it's an evaluation on both sides in terms of can you get people excited about what you're doing so that they exercise their networks and their relationships on your behalf. But if for some reason you're less effective at that, or you're still in the early stages of that, of that, tying together the first two comments, what Scott and Matt were saying, highly targeted notes do make it through. And if an entrepreneur hits on a theme or a particular area of focus that we're extremely excited about, those will get through. We have an internal process we call road mapping. Um, we, you know, we'll blog about it, we'll, we'll do interviews about it. A lot of the, the uh, public uh, remarks you'll see from me and my partners are about areas and themes of particular interest. We literally have you know, the cloud space divided into, into 10 sub roadmaps right now that are of interest. We've probably got 30 that aren't of interest. Um, and then we've got net new categories that we carve out where we're proactively focused. Some of those we share externally, some we don't. But point being, if, if you do your homework and you find out of the thousands of potential investors out there, the 50 or the 30 or the 10 that are a great potential fit for you, and you can do rifle shot outreach just like this wave of you know, kind of modern one-to-one -one marketing on the sales side, which your sales and marketing teams over time are going to be doing, uh, your hit rate goes way up. And if someone understands what I'm looking at, can reference other things that we've said or done that are synergistic, can reference positive exits we've had where we've made money and similar things, that dramatically increases the odds that we're going to take a first meeting and, and be interested to hear you out. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Because one thing that we're seeing with VCs is they're starting to do more and more blogging. And they're doing that to drive thought leadership, but they're also doing that to make sure that people understand when they walk in the door what to expect when they meet the VC. So like Brian said, doing your homework is going to be a key thing to get that uh, initial attention from the VC. So now that we've got the VC's attention, we're going to go into the pitch. Uh, and so we'll ask some questions around the pitch and doing due diligence. And so a question for, for Byron, when, you ha when you're in a pitch meeting with an entrepreneur, how much do you focus on the idea versus the entrepreneur? It varies by stage, frankly. Um, as a business is, is later stage, has metrics, has proof, then ultimately that does matter a lot. You're looking at the proof of, of the business and the validation, but most of our investing is pretty early stage. And so as exemplified by my Twilio comments earlier, um, the, the metrics weren't that exciting to be, to be friendly um, at that point. They were, they were interesting and early, but um, you certainly wouldn't have made an investment case based on any momentum. Um, the case was, you know, Jeff was a force of nature, and the, the product, the early product <coughs> signs were very cool. And from our standpoint, um, the idea is going to morph a hundred times over the course of building a business. And so uh, we fundamentally want to back a team that can run through walls and get it done and has some unfair advantage to accomplish it. They've got insights into a market, they have access to early customers, they have some product leverage um, and starting point that, that gets them, you know, the snowball rolling down the hill in a positive way that we can get excited about and build on. Thanks, Brian. Question for you, Scott. So you've been in dozens or hundreds of pitch meetings uh, going in thousands. and thousands of pitch meetings going in. And so what's the advice you want to give to the entrepreneur to, to be the best prepared? Uh, some things you wish they would do beforehand to prepare for the, the, the most optimal pitch meeting from your perspective. What can they do? 
Yeah, well, I mean, if we're talking specifically about the pitch, I mean, there's a lot of things you, you do, you know, in terms of company formation and depending on the stage we're looking at these companies, a set of milestones, we'd like to see them, you know, see them knock down. But if we're talking about just the pitch itself, I would say a couple things. One is do your homework on the venture firm. So make sure you understand their portfolio, their approach to investing, how they, you know, how they might view the space that you're investing in so that you come in and you actually, you know, we've had plenty of times where folks have, who have not really had any awareness of our portfolio and recognize either that there's you know opportunity or potentially conflict within that uh, within the portfolio and so I think that's one thing. The second is, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to overplay this, but I think that the, um, I, I see over and over again entrepreneurs shoot themselves in the foot with what I would regard as just not very good presentations. And you know, you you basically get 45 minutes to an hour to essentially make an impression and to, uh, to convince folks that this is a really big opportunity and this is a team that, that should execute against it. And um, you know, lots and lots of times on these presentations, we see folks either get lost in the weeds on the product and the details and not really kind of abstract it up into the market and the problem they're trying to solve or spend too much time at that, that market level and not really get into the details of why what they're doing is, is defensible and particularly difficult to replicate. So, you know, I really, you know, finding and striking a good balance of painting the high level picture about the problem you're trying to solve and why you, as, a, as an entrepreneur and as a company are uniquely positioned to solve it. So, it, And just one thing to add to Scott's point. Very specifically, think about the exits that have occurred in your space that are uh, similar businesses and look at the firms and the partners that back those companies. They made money, they understand it, they're gonna have positive context and you know, predilection to you, to you and your space. Look at partner companies that would be synergistic because they understand it, they'll give you some advantage. Look at competitors. You probably don't want to approach the partners that are in investors in competitive companies. That will give you your starter list probably of, of 30 plus firms and, and individuals specifically you can go after. You can send the emails or get referred into people that know them specifically and say, I want to talk to you for these reasons and my business should be interesting to you for these reasons, that's much more compelling both ways. I also think too, you know, if there's a, you know, if, if for instance I'm on the board of a company and if there's some relevance and you know somebody at that company, you know, you should take the opportunity in the meeting to make sure that, you know, you draw those connections because the first thing I'm going to do when I walk out of this meeting, if I'm interested, is I'm going to make a handful of calls to really do a high level kind of gut check on the, on the, either the team and the idea and if there's common connections then that just makes it that much easier. When you don't, Kind of go when you don't expl uh, explain or highlight those common connections. Sometimes you know just the the barrier associated with now I got to go figure out who I who I might engage with to make that that can actually you know introduce a little bit of friction into the process. So, so, so Matt, so the the meeting is done. You maybe have one or two follow up meetings with the entrepreneur, and they go off their merry way. And you're at your firm thinking and talking to your partners about the investment. What are you talking about? What goes through your mind after that pitch to make that decision to either invest or not invest? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, maybe just a quick build on what they're saying, and then get that is, I, you know, for us when company when when someone comes in, I think often if they're going to pitch us, they should be able to tell very clearly like how this is going to integrate and work with Salesforce and make us more successful. I think a lot of times companies come to us and they're sort of saying, hey, you know, how can you make me successful? And they haven't really done their homework. So I'd say if you're if you're going to approach corporates, like know their products, have like slides and even like mockups if you can, like how you're going to integrate, how you'd work with their products. Make it easy, make it an easy sale. Um, for us, after we kind of, you know, that first pitch, we think there's some excitement and then we want to go. Uh, what we do is we bring in our product teams. And so, you know, the nice thing is, is that in-house we have all of our product experts, all of our engineering teams. And so whenever we make an investment, we always have an executive sponsor. That ex executive sponsor is generally a GM because when we invest, we want to make sure that we're helping to pull the company into market uh, in one way or the other. So that's really where we focus a lot of our energy is making sure there's that strategic alignment, make, you know, comparing product roadmaps, making sure that there's good alignment there, making sure they understand, you know, how to build on our platform um, and that, there, you know, there, there's a path for a successful integration. So that's where we really, we, we then also go and do a lot of the financial metrics and do the same kind of analysis you would do as a traditional uh, VC, but we really focus on that strategic fit and that strategic alignment. And so that's why it's so important as an entrepreneur, when you're coming in, just lay out very clearly. Don't don't think that you know you're going to go to Amazon and Microsoft and Salesforce and they're all the same. You need to, you know, be focused and really have a have a, have a clear vision of how you're going to work together. So, at Byron, at BVP, tell us how, what that process looks like as well. Like, what's that decision making process look like at the BVP? 
Yeah, so I'll give you the BVP answer and then uh, the spectrum for the industry. Uh, at Bessemer, we're fairly decentralized in the sense that uh, individual partners can make decisions, and if you make enough bad decisions, then ultimately, you know, the scoreboard won't reflect in your favor, and, and in theory, your career will be cut short. But um, we believe in a model of kind of crimes of commission, not omission. So um, we encourage people to take some risks, and some of our best returns have been deals that had sort of split partnership feedback but ultimately had that outlier potential and that, that alpha. And so, uh, you know, from our standpoint, the people in the room can, can essentially make the decision in those first meetings. And then uh, you'll do a partnership meeting, usually to, uh, so that the group can hear the case It's part of our process, um, but we can, it's not a gate for the term sheet, it's not a gate for the process, deals get funded even without it. And so, um, for us, it's very much the team. There are other firms that have an entirely different approach, which is um, all partners, you know, the other extreme is all partners need to meet the company uh, uh, and weigh in positively before a term sheet uh, and various versions in between. There's not a right or a wrong answer. Um, Firms can be wildly successful with any combination of those approaches and, and a lot in between, um, but understand what your process is going into it. And it's totally reasonable as an entrepreneur to say um, a couple meetings in, help me understand you know, what your diligence process would look like, help me understand what your decision-making process is um, so that I can respond and, and give you the information you need and plan accordingly. And the things that generally don't work as part of that is this idea of false dates, false you know, competition, those sorts of things. Um, I've been a founder, I've been an entrepreneur, I've, I've tried some of those things, had them backfire. I, in general, um, transparency within reason makes sense. You don't need to say the other firms you're talking to, you don't need to say up front your valuation expectations specifically, or those sorts of things. But um, don't circle the wagons and call deadlines and dates until you have a term sheet on the table that's acceptable and that is credible um, because things can slip weeks or months um, in some cases. And if you create false deadlines and you roll through them, then, it's, then it suggests that the process is falling apart and then your credibility is called in question other ways. And similarly, I, I can't coach you strongly enough, never misrepresent status, stage, facts, elements, any of those things. Um, it's just, it, it's a black and white issue. Um, if there is, a, and there's, you know, there, there's times where there's enthusiasm and you're, you're stating numbers that are ahead because you, you can see getting there and that deal's almost signed and those sorts of things. But as we get into diligence, you either, you know, build on strong credibility and you start to draw trend lines of what you see or it erodes. And if you get in situations and you see patterns of overstatement, then our confidence in working together and the forward projections erodes uh, much more rapidly. And the chances of completing a transaction where that's happening is very, very small, and it ends up wasting your time, most importantly, and some of ours. Well, I, I mean, I take it one step further, which is, let's say you, you know, you're not fully transparent through the process, and you know, the, the venture firm ends up investing. You basically have set yourself up for a situation where you're going to have a you know, very big disconnect at the board level, which ultimately can be... Um, you know, can be very, very destructive for the company. And so it's just really important that, that for us, we don't want to feel like we're going to be managed as board members. We want to feel like we're engaging and we're having an open, honest dialogue and we are helping and contributing in a meaningful way. And if we don't get the sense during the conversation that that's the, the relationship that an entrepreneur wants, then it's probably just not a good fit for us. Yeah, and I think to, to build on Byron's point, though, you, you need to treat it like a sales process and you need to manage the process and make sure you understand what those deadlines are and those timelines are. You, time is your scarcest, um, you know, asset as well. So, so you you can't spend a whole bunch of time with every VC. You need to figure out who seems to be the most interested, what the process is. Make sure you feel like you're progressing. So, I think in a respectful way, you can manage that and push on it a little bit. Because I think the biggest thing I see is we often aren't leading rounds. We're we're following on with another institutional investor, and I just see the same signals. Entrepreneurs come in and they kind of have happy ears, and they're like, oh no, the meeting went good, but you know, the follow ups and the next steps are kind of nebulous. So if you don't feel like you're kind of getting that traction and you're, you're, there's clear milestones and what the next steps are going to be, you know, you're probably better off focusing on, on the handful of firms where, where you are getting that clarity. But it's up to you to really push that and drive that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of venture guys who really, really suck at saying no. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you feel like you're not getting traction but they're not saying no, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, at some point you should say no. Yeah. yeah so. The other thing I would say, too, is that I think when you talk about the amount of money you want to raise, I think it's always good to talk about it in a range. 
you know, because I think a lot of times companies want to go out and they ideally would like to raise, you know, eight million dollars, but that might be a stretch. It might imply, you know, uh, uh, check size and evaluation that you know a lot of venture firms might not be comfortable with. You might get it, but you might not. And if you end up having to come down from the eight and you're raising six or something, that's a sign of weakness that ultimately can come back and, and have an impact ultimately on how you're you're valued and and you know what in, in some cases actually can spook people away and say, well, you know, I really like this thing, but what, what don't I know? I must be missing something, and I think some investors might back off altogether. So it's always better to probably say six to eight or five to eight and walk up in terms of the amount raised uh, during a process. That's a great segue into the next section. So right now we've uh, identified a VC, and we've done diligence, and they've offered us a term sheet. So question for you, Scott. What, what are some of the terms in that term sheet that the entrepreneur thinks is really important, but at the end of the day, it's not important at all. and shouldn't really focus too much time on it. Yeah. Um, let's just assume that we're talking about a really standard clean term sheet. I mean, there are times when there are, you know, there are um, liquidation preferences or participating preferred and things like that, which actually have very meaningful impact on the ultimate return to entrepreneurs. And, you know, if those are terms in your term sheet, you should, you know, you should very carefully consider that. Um, but let's assume it's a relatively straightforward uh, term sheet. I think that um, I think there's a couple of things. I think a lot of times entrepreneurs get wrapped around the axle on the board composition, and they you know they want to control the board. And the reality is, the founders of companies control the company that they're that they're running. Uh, there is the decisions that get made at a board level are, you know, frankly, some of the least important decisions that get made at a company. And so I think that. Um, you know, a lot of times, and, and you know, we got to the point where we're fine with it. And, and you know, if, if if for whatever reason, if we really like the, the company, we really could trust and confidence in the founders, and they want a, a board that, that leans heavily towards the founders, that's fine. But I, I, I think a lot of times it 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 can leave a bad taste in the mouth because it kind of implies, um, you know, that you're not really sure that you want to collaborate, right? Um, and so I think that's one thing, but you know it is what it is. I think the um, sometimes the protect, protective provisions that we have as, a, as an investor to ensure that you know that we that um, that our preferred stock is being uh, protected on an ongoing basis. There are people that um, the entrepreneurs sometimes that, that uh, get concerned about what that actually means and what the implications are. But I think it's it's really just designed in this case is to ensure that. You know, you can't change terms that ultimately, like we invested one set of terms, you can't go later and change those conditions post the investment. Um, I think those are two areas. I'm trying to think about what else. I mean, I, I would say try and avoid highly structured term sheets. Like I you were saying, if it has full ratchets and 3x liquidation preferences and, and they're willing to do that because you can get a slightly higher valuation, it just creates this, this um, you know, disconnect between that round of investors and the other round of investors. And then when, if you have to raise another round, they're going to come in and they're going to look at this term sheet and it's going you know, it, it, to give them some unfair terms. And so I, I try, and, try and do very standard term sheets and don't optimize for valuation um, um, and, and maximize valuation and accept structure in return. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the key here is that you want to make sure that as an, as an entrepreneur, your incentives are aligned with your investors as close as much as possible. I mean, there's obviously, but you don't want to set up structure within the terms of the, uh, the cap table that have to set up these conditions where people are going to be on opposite ends of the table because in the end, the company is the, is the entity that suffers. So question for Byron. So you're negotiating a term sheet, but once the, the, the term sheet is signed, they become a board member. So how do you balance a, a fair and healthy negotiation? And the very next day, this person could be on your board. How do you, what advice can you give to entrepreneurs to help make sure you, you have that healthy negotiation, but fair, but still keep that relationship good for your eventual board member? So the interesting thing is that the, um, the term sheet discussions typically aren't contentious. In, um, and if they are, that may not be a great sign out of the gate, in the sense that it is the one time where you're on opposite sides of the table, typically, in the entire relationship. And that could be a period of 24, 48, 72 hours. It's a narrow window. But if it's, you know, if it's a strong deal that any one of us are going to fund, you have plenty of funding options. You probably have multiple term sheets, or you could get them if you chose to. We're not value investors, so we're not looking to get a bargain. We're not um, you know, private equity firms trying to make our money on terms. Um, I completely agree with the sentiment of the group, which is you know, as an entrepreneur and as an investor, I strongly prefer a totally clean, plain vanilla deal. And let's just talk about price and a few other things. But um, as early stage investors, we're not really in the weeds on terms trying to make our money there. What we're trying to do is pick 
you know, two awesome companies a year and bet you know, all in on those two companies out of the thousands that come across our desk. And so if you're one of those two and we can find a match, then yeah, we'll, we'll have a little bit of a discussion around price and terms and this or that. How big should the option pool be, plus or minus? But typically the entrepreneur is coming at it saying, um, I want to get a fair market price terms, et cetera, but I want this to be a win in the sense that we're going to be working together. I, you know, I'm not going to top peg every last penny for and do the full auction and this and that because um, you know, we want this to be set up for long-term success. We're coming in looking at it as you know, any current multiple of where you're at today is probably insane anyway, so we're looking at what you can become. And so at the end of the day, there's a little bit of back and forth, but you lock arms, you sign the deal, and you go, and then the next minute, the lawyers are figuring out how to pay for the long-form docs, and you're off building the company together. And so there's not this notion of, of a, a big transition. Um, and I would say if things get funky in that process, if there's revelations and diligence, if there are um, you know, uh, a bait and switch with terms, those sorts of things, typically the deal just doesn't happen. And so you don't get to that next stage of how do you work together because you say, you know, you've got limited data points to react to. If, you, if either side gets spooked by how you practice together, then you're probably not gonna play together and, and you walk. And yes, there's this period of exclusivity in the term sheet and when we sign a term sheet, we view it as our money's in and you, know, and you go and our, I don't know what our close rate is, but it's, I'm sure it's high 90s percent um, in terms of once you sign a term sheet, you go. Um, and so it's, it's just all about look forward and run. Anything that, that and Scott? I, I mean, it's, you know, the reality is when we win a deal, it's because we're at or near the highest price that, you know, they get, or we're, we're certainly above a threshold. And so, um, you know, the negotiations tend not to be very contentious. I mean, it's just, you know, this is what we can do. Is this attractive to you? And um, you know, if it is, then great. If it's not, then, you know, that's, that's fine too. So a lot of our uh, attendees here are based in Silicon Valley, but a big number are not based in Silicon Valley. And there's this question of, you know, how important is it to be located here in Silicon Valley versus, you know, uh, being outside of Silicon Valley? Should you move to Silicon Valley? So Matt, what's, what's your perspective on, on uh, having the entrepreneur, if they're not in Silicon Valley, yeah. how important is it being here? For I, that? I think the advantage of being here is I always, I always liken like a, a great entrepreneur, a company, it's like this raw diamond and, and you're trying to make these cuts and it takes multiple cuts to get this refined, polished, amazing diamond. And those cuts are these interactions you have with really talented people, with companies, with other entrepreneurs, with, with phenomenal VCs. And I think what you increase by being in the valley is that probability and those interactions. And so I think you accelerate the learning and the access to companies and to capital and the whole sorts of things. I mean, there are disadvantages. It's harder to recruit here. So there are some, some disadvantages, but I think it's not necessary. And there's some companies that do this well. Um, you know, Byron and I are investors in Vidyard, and I think the CEO has done a phenomenal job. He's, he's always in the valley, um, and he's done a fantastic job of, of assigning basically someone to own the Salesforce relationship. So every time he's, I see him in our building, he, even unannounced, and I just run into him all the time. So I think if you're not located here, you have to understand who are your key strategic partners. Uh, you need to make sure you're in the mi mix, meeting with other entrepreneurs, and just getting those interactions, those engagements, because that's really what's going to accelerate the growth of the company and make you a lot smarter really quicker. Yeah, I just want to add on Matt's final point, because uh, I'll say openly, Bessemer is totally and completely agnostic to where you're based. Um, we have six offices around the world. We truly believe the world is flat. Um, at no point will we say move to Silicon Valley. Um, I'm not even sure it's an advantage anymore to try to build a team here, given how hard it is. Um, you know, I was on the board in, in, uh, of Critio in France, the largest tech IPO uh, in Europe since 2000. I was on the board of Eloqua, one of the top three tech exits in Canada of all time. I was on the board of Cornerstone On Demand down in Santa Monica, largest tech I IPO out of Southern California. I'm on the board of Instructure in Salt Lake City, one of only four uh, cloud, one of, sorry, one of seven cloud IPOs last year. Um, you know, the world is truly flat. Uh, where you want to build your team, as long as you have access to talent, as long as you understand innovative cultures, and to Matt's point, are willing to invest in being where your customers are and where your partners are, you know, we don't care. We invested in Skype in Estonia, Celtel in Sub-Saharan Africa. Like, you know, great entrepreneurship's happening frickin' everywhere, and we're happy to be part of it. I think the one thing I'd say is from an entrepreneur's standpoint, the, the one comment I'll make, and I agree with everything these guys have said, though, but if you feel like you need a lot of help, if you feel like you need a lot of support um, in the early days, let's say you're a seed, a seed stage company or you're a, a very early Series A company, 
sometimes being close to your investors uh, has significant advantages. I mean, it's very difficult for us to project our ability, for instance, to help you build a team and sometimes to, to iterate as quickly if we're not close to you. And so we do a lot of investing around the world. Um, but I would say the, the, the earlier you are and the more you need help as an entrepreneur, the closer you want to be to your investors. So question for you, Matt. So we have the investment. You're doing well. Uh, six months down the road, you start thinking about that next round of investment. So help the entrepreneurs in the audience understand you know, how to think about that next round, thinking about how much they should raise, when they should start thinking about that next round, uh, to help them understand what, has, what goes in that, uh, that whole thinking process for the next round. And this is the presumption that we're already an investor? Exactly, yeah. um, how soon should you start thinking about the next round? Well, I think you sort of think about it when you close, when you close that round. I mean, you understand how long this, the capital is going to, uh, you know, you have in mind, you raise a certain amount. Here's the milestones you want to get to. Uh, you have to take into account, you know, it's going to take you three to six months, so you want to make sure that you have plenty of capital that you're not, you're not out raising when you have fumes. But I think, uh, you know, it really depends on the progress of the company towards the milestones, assuming you're hitting the milestones and you've, you've um, you know, you're going along the path that you've set. I mean, I think you kind of have a, a reasonably set timeline of, of, of when that capital is supposed to last you. Um, and then I think you go through that same process again. I think you have a sense for what the market will bear at the stage of the company you're at. You know that, you know, based on your metrics, you can raise X amount. You have a sense for how much dilution you want to take. Um, so that's going to help determine um, how much you want to raise. You also need to figure out how much you want to raise based on what are your milestones you want to hit, how many more people you want to hire, how many additional offices. And so I think it's, it's this kind of constant iterative process that I think as a CEO, you kind of always have to have at the back of your mind. And just uh, to add to that, it's likely that your next round investor is someone who didn't quite get there for your most recent yeah. round. Um, you know, that's your, uh, your funnel, if you will, your high probability funnel, and then you'll certainly add to that. But uh, there should be folks that you liked, that you got to know that were late to the process or didn't quite get there because of some objection, or maybe they, they prefer a little later stage and want to see you grow into it or something. Um, how you interact with them, how you handle turning them down or how you handle taking their turn down and how you communicate over the next year, two years, whatever, um, will materially change how they view you and their likelihood of coming in. And we see the full spectrum. We see people that flame us for, t for you know, standing down from a process. Um, and we see people that are absolutely awesome because they say, you know, help me understand why, you pa why you're passing or they're passing on us for X reasons, you know, and, and, but here's, here's why, you know, we want to keep working together and get to know each other better type of thing. Um, and we react to that. Um, and it doesn't mean that you need to try to, you know, have lunches with the person every quarter over the next two years because, frankly, that's inefficient for you and them. But the occasional email of, of key updates, you know, getting together six months before you're going to raise um, with uh, a full update going through sort of how you're thinking through things and an early preview, those sorts of things can make it a lot easier for your following processes. And I'll tell you a large number of the rounds I've done, um, including uh, Gainsight, which is a joint investment, were ones where we didn't quite get there in the prior round, couldn't quite meet the valuation process ask, et cetera. The company, you know, proved themselves out. We ended up paying a nice step up to the prior round. We, we don't have a lot of ego in the game. If we, if we believe that the company's made sufficient progress, we'll pay appropriate price and we'll come in aggressively to the next round. And in those cases, it's great for the entrepreneur because it's a short, efficient, tight process. And from our standpoint, we've got a year of you know, collaborative diligence, if you will, because we've seen how they've carried things out and that's the best proof for us. So the actual closing process is fast and easy. So one final question. This is a fun question. So as smart as these guys are, they don't get it right all the time. So I'd love to talk about the most successful investment you did not make, your anti-portfolio. So I want to understand what that was for each of you and maybe what you missed in that investment. Scott, why don't you go first? God, <laughs> damn it. Byron, go first. A bice time. The, the list is long, isn't it? It's yeah, kind of I painful. Mean, it's, I'm just trying to think about the... Uh, uh, we love you, AJ. Um, yeah. <laughs> We, we actually have a, uh, a tab on our website called the Anti-Portfolio to this end, and I'll, I'll tell you my answers personally in a minute. Um, but it, it's for the specific reason that uh, we want to remind entrepreneurs that uh, we screw up all the time, and, uh, and there will be an investor most likely for you, probably many, um, but uh, it's all a probability game, and we miss stuff 
painfully all the time. And with our you know, two shots on goal a year, um, we meet dozens of companies we really like, we're really excited by, and just can't quite get there. Um, for me, mine is Tesla. Uh, where met with them repeatedly early on, actually um, was one of the first, you know, hundred roadster uh, car owners. My sister uh, produced the Who Killed the Electric Car movie, so it was all around the world. Loved what they were doing, but fundamentally um, couldn't see a net new car company, particularly at the luxury end, being created. And it wasn't, uh, you know, there were a lot of, uh, of positive factors that lined up, including the, I think it was $400 million DOE loan to, to get them over the goal line. But and the Toyota. Um, and the Toyota, uh, you know, bankruptcy free, and the factory. factory, all these things line up. But fundamentally, Elon, Elon, by the way, wasn't even the CEO when we first interacted. It was with Martin, and then he took it back over. But it went through this story arc where um, a phenomenal entrepreneur with a change the world vision that um, he made it happen. And that one, I, I uh, paid full price for my Model X recently and <laughs> drive it every day and have, am reminded painfully how uh, they've gotten my money, but only as a customer, <laughs> and, uh, and we got nothing back. Yeah, I was actually going to say Tesla, but uh, uh, the other one similar to that was Nest. And I think what was common to both Tesla and Nest was, you know, I, I'd been doing clean tech investing, and I was just like, was convinced people aren't going to pay for fuel efficiency. People don't really care. They're not going to pay about saving home energy. But I think what both of those companies did was, you know, buying a Tesla really isn't about about saving uh, fuel. It's more about buying an iPod and like a really cool, well-designed car. Um, and I think Nest kind of tapped into that same sort of um, aesthetic and design and coolness factor. Uh, I mean, people care at some level, but I don't think that was the main motivator. And I think I was probably being a little too logical on these things. And, and that's why I was just like, this makes no sense. And, and on both of those, and I, that's I, a, that, that, we've gotten to the point where we say this makes no sense. We should be investing yeah. in those companies. Um, <laughs> As a firm, we've turned down both of those deals. Uh, and so, as an individual, Palo Alto Networks is probably the one that hurts the most, which is a you know ten billion dollar plus company today. And we, you know, we had uh, spent a bunch of time with those folks at the uh, Series A. So. so you're going to receive a lot of no's as an entrepreneur. It's going to be a tough, tough uphill battle, but sometimes things work out for the for the best. So. Um, I'm going to go off script here. I know the AV guy is going to kill me, but I do want to take a couple of questions from the audience. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I want to make sure that we get this to be a bit more interactive. So we can take about two or three questions. If you can stand up, shout the question, I'll repeat it, and we can go there. I'll take this woman right here. Hi. Um, so when you're going into a Series A or Series B, who from the team do you want to meet? Because like with our seed round, it was just me. But now that we're going to these different conversations, it's a different game. And so who do you want to talk to? So who should you talk to in a series A or seed round? Who from the company should uh, you meet with with the VCs? Yeah, so it's basically the pitch team. Um, usually the flying formation will be um, the business and technical leads, often they're co-founders or a strong one-two combo. For later stage companies, the CFO will often replace the technical uh, lead. And, um, and then you'll reveal the technologist to us in subsequent meetings. But you don't need to go five deep uh, in these discussions. You've got a company to build. Um, the CEO is really um, the person we're interacting with first. And then we'll do, um, and you can gate your team through subsequent meetings. But having some insight into the product side, uh, if the founder or CEO is not the product uh, head, is often really helpful, because that tends to be our first line of questioning and area of most interest. Orion. Uh, so as venture capitalists, you have to have a broad network to bring in great entrepreneurs. You have to be able to identify great companies, and you have to be able to offer valuable advice when you're on the board of these companies. So I'm wondering what distinguishes a phenomenal venture capitalist and makes them valuable both to the venture firms they work for and to the entrepreneurs that they advise. So the question is, what, what does it take to be an outstanding VC? It's a multi-skill set uh, involved there. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Uh, what I would tell you, this is one of those businesses, every time you think you've figured it out, the, the rules of the game change pretty fundamentally. But, um, you know, I, I mean, in the end, we're measured on the kind of returns we, we end up generating. So, you know, we invest X dollars and we get back hopefully a big multiple of that uh, in the end. And so um, uh, that's how we're assessed by the folks who are our bosses, which are our limited partners. Um, but I think, it, you know, in, in how that ended up manifesting itself. You have to be able to see over the horizon. A lot of times the things we're doing and the companies we're investing in are frankly not obvious in any way, shape, or form. And I think there is a having the, the guts to make a call that you really believe in that, that is, you know, everyone will tell you that you're absolutely crazy. And this is exactly, by the way, everything I'm describing is 
exactly what you need to be a successful entrepreneur too, which is you're going to be told time and time again what you're doing is crazy, yet you're dedicating your entire life to it. I mean, it's, it's um, that ability to see over the horizon and have that kind of, in, that, those kind of instincts, I think is ultimately the most important and biggest uh, differentiator from one venture capitalist to the next. So. One more question, then we got to wrap it up. Considering the state of the market and the climate we're in right now, how is that impacting your, the, the amount of deals you're doing this year at your firms? I mean, we're kind of unique. We'll do 25 new deals a year, smaller checks. So it's not really impacting us. I think we're, we're putting in smaller checks is how it's impacting us. Same. A similar pace, but um, the market is adjusting for later stage deals and particular valuations have come down. Um, for earlier stage companies, it typically just means smaller raises, uh, but that rolls through. I do think that the labor market will oscillate a bit, so your cost of building um, the company should moderate a bit as well. I, and I'd say the same. For, we're not, we, we probably invest in about 15 companies a year, but um, I've heard every venture guy say that... Um, hey, we're doing what we always do, but the reality is the number of deals that are getting done right now is, is definitely down. And, and I have actually had conversations with some venture firms that are, have done dramatically fewer than before. And I don't think that has anything to do with the valuation environment, even the fundraising environment. I think at a certain level, it's, it's about people have invested in so many companies over the last couple of years. I think there's a little bit of indigestion right now as people try to work through their portfolio and, and give themselves capacity to do some more companies. So. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you so much for the time and the insight. I, w I also want to quickly thank you guys for, for uh, attending. And a quick plug for the Twilio Fund. We are actively looking for innovative companies. Go to twilio.com backslash Twilio Fund or come see me so we can talk about the Twilio Fund. Thank you very much.